Public Committee for the Humanities in Pennsylvania presents the Humanities Profiles of Children's Authors, part of the Profiles in Literature series featuring interviews with persons prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter of Tempe University. Today's special guest is Katherine Patterson. Profiles is delighted to present the outstanding author of children's books, Katherine Patterson, who's recently settled in Norfolk, Virginia. How was the move? I think, let's talk about some other things. <laughs> <laughs> the rugged, rugged experience. Uh, Mrs. Patterson has traveled extensively. For four years before her marriage, she lived in Japan. Please greet us in Japanese. What does that mean? It means, this is the first time I have met you. Please be kind to me. I will be. I will be. It's a beautiful language. Mm -hmm. Our cosmopolitan guest was born not in Japan, but in China, where her father was a Presbyterian missionary. How old were you on your first visit to the United States and when you settled permanently? Uh, I was five the first time I came and eight the last time. You bring an unusual background to your mm -hmm. writing. Joining me in welcoming you is my Temple University colleague, philosopher Monroe Beardsley. Very nice yeah. to meet you. Also with us is my companion from the Profile series, Carolyn Field, coordinator of work with children for the Free Library of Philadelphia. Welcome to Philadelphia, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. Beginning with the sign of the chrysanthemum in 1973, T.Y. Crowell has published Katherine Patterson's books. Her name has become a symbol for quality writing. Her Nightingales That Weep was an American Library Association notable book, as were the three books that followed. In 1977, The Master Puppeteer won the National Book Award and the Mystery Writers of America Edgar Allan Poe Award. In 1978, Bridge to Terabithia received this coveted Newbery Medal. In 1979, The Great Gilly Hopkins was the only Newbery Honor Book. That's some accomplishment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this photograph shows your family with you when you received the Newbery Medal. Please identify family members. Uh, uh, on the left here is John Jr., who is now 14, and Lynn, who is 16, and Mary, who has just turned 11, and David, who is 12. And behind are my husband, John Sr., and myself. Uh, Catherine, what does your husband do? Uh, he's a Presbyterian clergyman. Oh. Uh, tell us a little bit about the background of your two children, the two girls. Uh, Lynn uh, is uh, Chinese. Uh, she was born in Hong Kong, and Mary is Apache on one side in Kiowa. Oh, how Native American. Fascinating. Well, what does uh, Lynn's name mean in Chinese? Well, her Chinese name is Polin, which was given to her in the orphanage. Polin. And it means precious life. Oh, and what does Mary's uh, mean in Apache? Uh, Mary's uh, Apache name is Nahisa Pachia, which was given to us. Uh, we had a friend at the Bureau of American Indian Affairs. He sent a runner. Uh, he called Will Rogers Jr. in Oklahoma, senior, in Oklahoma City, who sent a runner to the reservation to the little old lady who gives names. And the uh -huh. name she sent back was Nahisa Pachia. And I said, can't we have something shorter? He said, look, the lady gave you the name, you take it. That's it. <laughs> and it means? It means a young Apache lady. Young yeah, Apache. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, these children are adopted. Now, most uh, uh, parents find it very difficult to talk about uh, d adoption to their children. How, did you, uh, how do you handle it with your children? You have two adopted and two that are in your own. Oh, well. Uh, one thing is you don't protest too much. You don't tell them how wonderful it is to be adopted all the time because they'll immediately be suspicious. <laughs> I, I can understand that. Um, when the question comes up, we talk about it. And they have had no problems in school or any place? Uh, well, occasionally. Once in a while. Uh, but they, I think they handle it very well. Well, your book, which is the uh, honor book this year, the mm. great Gilly Hopkins, which in my opinion is one of the great books of all time, is about a foster child. Uh -huh. 
Your uh, relationship uh, in the book between the child and the uh, foster mother was so marvelous that you, have you had some experience with uh, foster children? The reason I wrote a, child, a book about a foster child is because I was a temporary foster mother. I didn't ever mean to I be, see. but it was one of these flukes because we had adopted, they could ask us because we had already been investigated and we were all right. So we took two boys for what we thought was going to be two weeks to turn down and out to be two months. And what I learned was that I'm a terrible foster mother. Oh, really? Yes. Because I would say to myself when something went wrong and something went wrong many times every day, I can't really deal with that because he's only going to be here a short time. I see. And I was treating the child like a Kleenex. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing worse. I mean, what crime can you do worse to a person? Which is entirely different from the way Mrs. So I, Tanner of course, reacted. Of course, I created the world's greatest foster mother to make up for all my sins. Uh, oh, you mean Mamie Trotter? <laughs> Mamie Trotter, yes, the, the perfect yes, one. Yes. I hear you. I see the psychology <laughs> yeah, of yeah. that. We're going to leave discussion of your home while Dr. Beardsley focuses on your books. Dr. Beardsley. One theme that seemed to me to run very strongly through all five of these uh, very interesting novels, is what might be called uh, the tragic sense of life. Mm -hmm. Now, that, you might think that's a bit pretentious, yeah. <laughs> but I, don't, I really mean something here that seems to me very important. Uh, roughly, a, an ability to look at life in a kind of, in all its wholeness, so to speak, uh, recognizing without being depressed or uh, discouraged, but still recognizing that time and change sweep away many precious things and and that uh, joy and love are quite often uh, come quite often come to an end uh, it seems to me that the young characters the young protagonists in your novels are are uh, quite wise in this regard they they come to acquire this somewhat stoical ability to face up to the evils and misfortunes of life and, and uh, this is true, I think, very well, it comes out very well in the, in the uh, beautiful account of Leslie Burke's death, for instance, and mm -hmm. of the effect it has on her uh, friend. Uh, and in uh, Gilly Hopkins, who, well, she does have one illusion about her mother, which until the end of, of the novel, but for the most part, she, she knows what she's up against and she's able to ride along with it mm -hmm. and so on. So, and, and it, I wondered whether you think I'm reading something too much into the novels when I stress this. Well, it sounds very grand when you say it. I don't know. Um, I, I probably would never use the phrase tragic sense of life because I think of myself as a very optimistic. Um, yeah. Well, it doesn't really Hopeful preclude person. optimism, but it does. Here's where a philosopher yeah. gets. <laughs> There's a wonderful sentence in, um, I guess it's in uh, Sign of the Chrysanthemum mm -hmm. uh, about the sword maker Fujuki. Fukuji. Fukuji, uh -huh. I'm sorry. And it, it's, I think I can quote it, something like this. Uh, As he watched the fragile flakes, the snow is falling, mm -hmm. melt on the stones, he felt in his heart the pain of a man who has seen many years and many lives begin in brightness and then fall away and, and disappear, mm -hmm. something of that mm -hmm. sort. Mm -hmm. And this does not discourage him, but it, uh, it's a recognition that this is the way things are. And I wonder if, if you if have felt, uh, if had the thought that, that maybe this is something that your young readers can learn from reading novels, good novels, that is, mm. and, and it helps, it might help them to grow mm. in courage and wisdom. I, I have to confess that when I, I start a book, I'm working on my own problems and fears yes. and anxieties, and I, I wonder, if when I start wondering about the book, which is very late in the game, I think, this is such a private thing. Mm. I don't think anybody else is going to understand this. And it's, uh, it's a, invariably a pleasant surprise. The first person who reads it is my husband, and he understands it. And I think, well, at least one other person understands yes. this. And then I give it to my editor, and she understands it. And I, two people understand it. And often I read out loud to my children. And if they understand it, then I have some hope that what I've said is not so private that no one will understand it. But in the beginning, I'm never quite sure if anybody's yes. going to understand what it's about, because it's a very private exercise for me. 
and uh, selfish in many ways because the thing, yeah, you, you know, when you assign noble aims to me, I'm, I'm embarrassed because it, essentially it's a very selfish process that I'm going through. You, that you know, I agree with the, amount to me. Uh, Dr. Beersley about this uh, theme mm -hmm. of this tragic sense of mm -hmm. life very much, but there are other themes in your book. Uh, what, what are some of the other themes that you are mm -hmm. trying to the identify and by book? Oh, well, you know, I, I, I feel silly when people ask me, to, <laughs> because I think, well, if I could have said it in one sentence, why did I waste 128, 190 pages? <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, in Sandra of the Chrysanthemum, uh, it's sort of um, becoming what you are. And you always become what you are through fire. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to fulfill what's there is a painful as well as a joyful process. And, and so the, it's a little, you know, this sounds so hokey, but it's a little bit of the parallel between the forging of the sword and the forging of the boy. Mm -hmm. The essential elements were there all, the, all along, but without the fire and the water, mm -hmm. uh, the sword never is sharpened and is never worthy. Uh, the hokey, right? <laughs> I, I think no, Billy Hopkins uh, is the same yeah. thing. And, and I may be repeating this yes. theme. I'm, I'm not, my editor pointed it out to me that I tend to repeat this theme. Right. Uh, but it's, you know, uh, the, the second one is, is, was the whole Nightingales, Nightingales of, the, of Nightingales that Weep sort of grew out of a telephone call I had from a person who was trying to reach my husband, who is a pastor, and I couldn't remember who the person was, and then I thought, that's the ugliest man I ever saw in my life. And then I thought, my gosh, what, it would be like, what would it be like if that was the first person, first thing anybody ever said about you? That's mm -hmm. the ugliest person I ever saw in my life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sort of an expiation of my mm -hmm. sins. Um, how must it be? not to be able to relate normally to other people because always you will have this barrier oh. that you can do nothing about. And of course there were all of these barriers with us. I mean, they're of color or class or education or mm -hmm. just physical attributes that... Mm -hmm. that maybe so you were speaking against vanity. Well, mm -hmm. I don't know. You know. Right. Uh -huh. And in your uh -huh. third book, The Master Puppeteer. Uh, well, Master Puppeteer is uh, nothing is as it appears to be. Uh, and uh, and the thing that hasn't uh, that that I get questions from children a lot is about the mother in the master puppeteer, which worries them a lot. Yeah. I mean, why is the mother so mean? Well, is the mother so mean? She was trying to survive. Uh, I think, uh, yes. and of course, you have this lovely uh, the puppet theater to to sort of you know do things for you on the side. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. And your um, and bridge. Uh, Bridge, which every, or not everybody, but a lot of people say is a book about death, is not in my mind a book about death, but a book about friendship. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the proportion of the book, uh, most of the book is about friendship. <laughs> Truly is. And even the end of the book mm -hmm. um, is what, because death is a part of every friendship. Yes. Death of some kind. The parting, continuity parting is implied at the end. And uh, so. Uh, and, and Gilly is, um, uh, maybe Gilly is a son of the chrysanthemum in American dress, I don't know, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, life is tough, but it, there's nothing better than doing mm -hmm. good at a tough job, <laughs> like, yeah. um, as Trotter says. And if I may add one other, uh, invite, comment on another theme, I was really very strongly struck, uh, probably because of my own special interests, with the, very, with the central role that the arts play in all your novels, mm -hmm. there's a tremendous uh, affection for an understanding of poetry in Gilly, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and there's the Koto in the, in the mm -hmm. uh, Nightingales, and the, and the Potter, uh, the ugly Potter uh, whom you referred to, is tremendously sensitive when it comes mm -hmm. to his pots, mm -hmm. and so on. So that, in, and I think in every novel, the swordsmith, uh, the swords are treated not only as symbolic objects, uh, but also as uh, works of art in a way. So, mm -hmm. And uh, it seemed to me that um, this must be a very important interest of yours. And I wonder if you have thought that uh, through such stories as these, your young readers can 
be helped to get a better understanding of the importance of the arts in human life. Yeah, well, there again, you see. <laughs> you, didn't really, you didn't set out to do that. No, I didn't really set out to do it. And actually, this is a point that has been pointed out to me after the, I've done the books, and I think, oh, yeah. gee, I really do spend a lot of time. But uh, I think it's because, uh, well, there, one thing is, of course, the arts are so tied up with Japanese life, you could hardly <laughs> write a book about Japanese life sure. uh, without um, having it. But, but I think, if I can analyze myself. But it's, they're lovingly, the, the song, the koto, and then the songs that, uh -huh. the, that the swordsmith sings are mm -hmm. lovingly described. And, I mean, well, which is good. Uh, very being good. able to totally absorb yourself in creation is the thing that distinguishes us from our brothers and sisters, the animals, right? Yes. And, and I think uh, this sort of caring, real caring is, is, well, let me tell you a story. When I was in Japan, I was eating supper at a Japanese friend's house, and I, the vegetables, the vegetables in Japan, this was when I lived there, which was many years ago, and I trust this still, still true, the vegetables are absolutely marvelous. And I said, why are Japanese vegetables so delicious? And she said, without a blink, because the Japanese farmer loves every vegetable. Uh -huh. And I, I, it's, it's caring. It carries uh -huh. over. Uh -huh. You know, it's this, yes. this kind of caring uh -huh. that, uh, uh, that makes, makes creativity uh, worthwhile. And of course, in my books, the, uh, the artist, their art is almost a religion, but the protagonists have to combine their creativity with the caring for other people mm -hmm. before they're through. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, that's me. I, I, I can't get them unhooked. Well, you know, yes. Catherine, uh, uh, skillful writing is an art, too. Right. And your characters are painted so vividly. Do you put yourself into any of them? Well, uh, some kid asked me yesterday who Maybelle was, and I said, that's me. And he said, you're Maybelle? And I said, yes, I'm Maybelle. Um, I was this scrawny little dumb kid with romantic notions that I couldn't articulate. I mean, what else is Maybelle, you know? But you were other characters. Uh, but I, I'm other people, too. And, mm -hmm. and uh, one time, my husband was couldn't possibly understand what I was about. And I said, John, don't you understand? I'm William Ernest. He said, you're William Ernest? And I said, oh. yes, I'm William Ernest. And once I said that, he, you know, he said, oh. <laughs> oh, then you identify yeah. with yes, each of your characters. Yes, of course. And, and Mamie Trotter is, is my dream wish of what I was. What, what was. you should have been yes, is a foster mother. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, that well in what way is Jesse Aarons from Bridge to Terabithia most like you? Well, because he's scared to death, he's mm -hmm. of death. Mm -hmm. How do his ideas about death parallel your own? Well, absolutely. I mean, I didn't get those ideas from anybody <laughs> except myself, if you want to know. My feelings mm -hmm. about death, all you have to do is read that book. There are no secrets. Mm -hmm. And uh, one reason the book was, uh, I'm sure you know, or most people do know, that it grew out of the friendship that my 12-year-old had with a girl who was very dear to all of us, and she was killed. Uh, she was struck by lightning. And the kid asked me yesterday why I didn't put that in the book, and I said, because nobody would believe that. That's, uh -huh. You know, you don't accept that kind of thing. Mm. But it, it was just after I had gone through a cancer operation. And so when I started writing the book thinking I was going through the child's death, of course, what I was doing was, was facing my own death, which became a very difficult thing, in which when I came up to the chapter when the child was supposed to die, it was many, many days before I could do that. And then finally a friend said to me, you know, how's your book coming? And I said, I can't go through Lisa's death again. And she said, you can't, it's not Lisa, Lisa's death, Catherine. Uh -huh. I so I went home and faced my own death. Uh -huh. So I'm, you know, the, the, the thing that it, it suddenly dawned on me, as long as you're writing and nobody's paying attention to what you're doing, you're getting away with it. And then suddenly people look at it and I think, it's just like I'm naked in church. Everybody knows everything about me. <laughs> true. And it, uh, true. you know, mm -hmm. if you want to know what I'm like, all you have to do is read the books, and there I am. Well, this Better supports worse. Dr. Beardsley's statements about the tragic sense of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you would continue, Dr. Beardsley. Mm. Well, I was. I did have another thought that mm. I would like to draw you out on, if I may, and that is, well, it has to do with this 
with per perennial conflict between those who, writers who see novels as essentially or primarily reflecting social conditions mm -hmm. under which they're created and perhaps as uh, ideally oriented toward the solution of social problems mm -hmm. and uh, other creative writers who see the novel as essentially or, or at least mostly a, a free imaginative construct mm -hmm. with with uh, aesthetic mm -hmm. properties as primary. Uh, this is a kind of an oversimplification too and I suppose that it may, it, some people would say it's not a very illuminating sort of a contrast but I, had, I noticed that a concern for society and, and about social problems is, well, it lies in the background of the bridge to Terabithia because Leslie Burke's parents are obviously socially conscious. They're worried about the whale and so on. And then, in, uh, it's, of course, it's in the foreground of Gilly Hopkins, who is caught up in a, in a very difficult mm -hmm. social problem. Uh, but it's also very rampant in the, in the other books. But you give a tremendously powerful picture in, uh, in the puppeteer, for instance, of, so, of social upheaval, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. hunger riots and so on, mm -hmm. class warfare and so on. And I just wondered if, if this important theme, which is, as it seems to me in the novels, is something that, that you were thinking about, thought about very much too, or has that just yeah. come out of your no, own experience? I, I don't set out to write a novel about a social problem because I'm not qualified to do that. The only, the only life I have to write out of is my own life. But I think it's significant that when those first three novels were written, uh, the Japanese. Japanese novels, which all three are set in periods of terrible civil unrest mm -hmm. in Japan, I was living through the riots of Washington. Uh -huh. And um, yes. uh, living in an, uh, an integrated area, one block out of the city of Washington. Yeah. And uh, all through the Vietnam demonstrations, the Vietnam War, uh, all of those things were a part of my life, and I didn't consciously set out to put them in my books, but I'm sure, uh, what, what is it, C.S. Lewis says that the writer cannot be what the man is not. Um, oh, yes. Um, the woman, <laughs> the, the books, uh, of course, can only come out of my life. Um, yes. I don't have any other life. <laughs> our experience except that, and I'm sure it's related. Yes. Although Speaking of, of social consciousness. Yes. Yeah. Why do your books empathize with the underdog, always? I was a weird little kid. And I came back to the United States, and I spoke English, you won't believe this, with a British accent. Mm -hmm. I wore clothes out of the missionary barrel, which is not, think, new Bethesda friends. It's uh, yes. Salvation Army leftovers. Uh, and it's, uh, I could come over from somewhere over there, and children are sort of vague on geography, so I mean, I might as well have been a Japanese spy as far as my peers were concerned. And I came into this thing, the only thing I could do anything about was my accent, which I got rid of, I'm sure, in three weeks. Um, and uh, I, I'm a grown-up lady, and I move in polite society, and people are very nice to me, but you never lose the child who did not know how she would be ex accepted when she moved towards a playground group. Mm -hmm. or. Um, who would laugh when she raised her hand in class. I'm going to mm -hmm. um, ask about another aspect mm -hmm. now, about your writing. Where did you learn to perfect your magnificent writing? <laughs> Please, we'll do discuss uh, that. But it wasn't easy for you, I know. Um, um, I, I apparently have been writing since I was a child, like most people. But I started writing because I was asked to write for the Presbyterian Church, and I discovered that with four little children at home, writing was something I could do. And I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I did not publish. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I did take a class on writing for children for adult education in Montgomery County. I wrote the signs of the chrysanthemum one, one chapter a week for that class. Uh, I think. Probably the way you learn to write is to write. I had a wonderful English professor in college who made me write all the time. Uh, I, 
But you do say you took a course, and I think this is important mm -hmm. for people yeah. to know. This helps. Uh, helps it's a great some. discipline. It imposes a discipline write. on the outside, but but the teacher can't write for you. I mean, all he can do is write. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody says, well, why don't you go get those things that were rejected all those years and yeah. sell them now that you're famous? I read them. I'm not going to, but they weren't good no, enough. I was learning how to write. How long did mm -hmm. it take you before you got your first uh, book published in '73? Well, well, I started writing seriously in '64. So it took you about... Yeah, and, and I did have the thing published that the church had asked me to write. But I had practically, Nine years. I had practically nothing else published until 73, fall of 73, when Sign of the Chrysanthemum was published. And uh, how have your editors helped you? Oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> um, Sign of the Chrysanthemum had been going around for two years when uh, Sandra Jordan, who is now for our stress, um, Jero, she was at that time just out of college, the first reader yeah. for Kroll, and she took it to Ann Benedice, and Ann Benedice decided to take a chance on a book that nobody in his right mind would publish. I mean, who's going to sell, I mean, who is going to buy a book about 12th century Japan That's for right. children? Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. nobody did. Uh, the book never went out of its first printing until I wanted to be very. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she took a chance on it, and uh, Virginia Buckley has been my editor. All the, all the way through. And it's, I think pe people th have the wrong idea about publishing. They think that writers will write away in their ivory tower and, and that's it. You don't. You write away in your ivory tower. It's a very personal, private process. But once you've got something, then it becomes a community effort. And uh, it's not fair for the, my name to be on those books because Virginia uh, is such a wise editor and, and knows she doesn't ever tell me what to do. She tells me what's wrong mm -hmm. and gives me the courage to know that I can do something about it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she's a, just a magnificent editor. Why mm -hmm. haven't you written about China? Because I don't have the language of Chinese in my head anymore. And I can't, I can't write I in a language I don't hear. I must tell you that it's wonderful not seeing illustrations in the great Gilly Hopkins. How do you feel about oh, that? Yes, that of course. It's conveyed through mm -hmm. the, the uh, words a lot? I want the readers to illustrate the book in their heads. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine Patterson. We've just met a magnificent children's author. She's also a minister's wife, Sunday school teacher, curriculum writer, and member of the church choir. Without moralizing, her books champion the have-nots of the world and spin fantastic yarns. Good health, bonsai, yeah. live forever. Thank you. La 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 la